before you can walk or talk, you're kind of like dumped on the floor and put in front of you are building blocks. Why? Why is that the first thing that we want to teach our kids? Before they can talk, before they can walk, it's more important than talking and walking then, isn't it? Isn't it? Or we wouldn't be doing it, but we do. You did it, I did it, and they're all still doing it. In 1833, Scottish anatomist and neurologist Charles Bell observed that the hand is not a thing appended or put on like an additional movement in a watch, but a thousand intricate relations must be established throughout the body in connection with it, such as nerves of motion and nerves of sensation. But even with all this super-added organization, the hand would lie inactive unless there were created a propensity to put it into operation. So if we get you to write your names on the board, and can you also either put N, S or L after your name? If you've got no experience at all, just put N, some or lots. I've always enjoyed looking at objects and wondering how they were. I mean, I was always the child that took their record player apart. And that for me, being able to put things together and know how things work, that's always been important. I've never like sawn anything in my life, I've never held a chisel. I was like, wow, this, I'm, I'm liking this. I'm really glad I chose this. Yeah, I wish someone had said at school, kind of, there are alternative options. And we didn't really do any subjects that were particularly hands-on. I think maybe art was the only one. Mainly what I've learned is to have no preconceptions about people, what they can do, what they've done before, what they're capable of achieving, and what they're going to be in two years' time. Nobody knows what's going to happen, and that's what makes teaching exciting. It's what, what stops the whole thing jarring. The power of making is amazing. I'd love to be able to make something. That's the newest thing we've got. I like to understand how the stuff that we use works, so don't like it to be a mystery. I'm trying to learn, you know. It, I think I'm learning how to learn still. It's about trying to find out what it is that they want, what they need, where they want to go, and where their limit is. Hands are the most efficient part of our bodies for manipulating objects and for physically modifying our environment. Our fingertips have evolved to contain some of the densest concentration of nerve endings in the body, so the sense of touch is most powerfully associated with the hand. Our hands are intimately joined to our brain by the nervous system. The hands and the brain mutually generate activity and development in one another. In the words of neurologist Frank Wilson, brain is hand and hand is brain. I think with something that you do with your hand, something so practical, it is really like the only way to learn is by actually doing it. You can watch videos or read books, but until you've actually tried it, you're not going to know how to do it. Probably 95% of the valuable teaching that goes on in here goes on in the practical immediate so if something's not going quite right for them it could be that we have to then look at what are the usual things that go wrong what can you rule out straight away and, and these are the things that teach them about what to look for and I only know those one because I've made the mistakes myself and you always remember your mistakes more <laughs> And two, because I've taught the same things enough times to know this is the danger point, this is the most likely thing that goes wrong, this is where most people struggle. So that if you looked at it from this side, you'd know immediately where your face edge is. If yeah. you looked at this from that side, you'd know immediately oh, yeah, where your face edge is. Yeah? Okay, that's the reason for it being like that. 
I think mistakes probably are almost crucial. I don't know how you would learn if you never made a mistake. Well, you wouldn't be learning then, would you? You know, you'd already know it in a way. You learn from your mistakes. You have to be aware enough of what you're doing to improve it, otherwise you're never going to be any good. But you can't coast with something like this. The second you disengage with something like this, you either mess up what you're doing or you hurt yourself, or both, usually. So the concentration element of it is, you know, the intensity of it. You have to do it with your whole being. I mean, out of all the things I've done over the years, this is by far the hardest thing I've ever done. I think it's extremely difficult because of the complexity of it, even the processes. Acquiring good hand skills involves more than simply training the hands to perform a series of correct actions. Good hand skills demand good posture and the coordinated rhythmic movement of other body parts. Being a skilled carpenter means being able to respond to the properties of the timber and knowing how to make the necessary adjustments to one's tool-wielding actions. Woodwork requires the parallel use of multiple perceptual senses. What I try to teach them from the beginning is to learn to trust uh, what their eyes are telling them and what their fingertips are telling them because this is an... This is a living, breathing material. Each piece of timber can talk to you. I've always wanted to be able to make things out of wood, and I don't really know why. I mean, I like the fact that wood's, you know, there's something quite pure about it. With one tool, I could make something without making any noise. The point of it is that it's wood, to me. It's like, if you just want to make a shape, make it plastic, make it metal, it's easier to work with. Why are you making it out of timber? The whole idea is that it's this difficult, alive, if you like, material. Tools are already a part of the world that we are born into, and the basic properties and function of many have changed little since ancient times. Evolution of the brain-hand connection was necessary for making and using tools. But likewise, Tool use played a pivotal role in the further evolutionary development of the human hand and the brain. The tight relation between brain, hand and tool is at once physical, neurological, psychological, cultural and social in nature. This multifaceted relation holds the key to what makes us human. So it's all about what your hand's doing and if only we could make like Edward Scissorhands and like have chisel fingers when we wanted them and saw hand, like edge of your hand, be a saw when you wanted it to be. You could do away with the tools completely. Even once you've selected the timber, a lot of it is just being able to feel how the tool responds to it. So a lot of it is feeling it and usually with the tool to know how it's going to behave as well. There's so many different skills to master. Planing and chiselling are totally different. It's all the bits, it's, it's basic geometry. It's, there's a million different aspects to it, and I love that about it. The planing is my favourite thing by a mile, and I love it. Like, it's, there's, nothing, there's nothing that's satisfying with that. When it works, when it doesn't work, it's really frustrating, but when it works, it's, it's, it's great. Like. You kind of always feel like it's an extended part of you, your tool, you know, you kind of, before when I hold it, like, this is an object, and I'm using this object to make or cut wood or chisel away, but um, now it just feels more like an extended part of me. You can kind of feel it at the end of the chisel, you know, rather than I'm just pushing this object into it. You get more of an understanding of the feel of like, oh, you know how the chisel is on the wood by the feel of it, not by looking. I think practice makes perfect, but it's definitely the feel. At first you have it and it's like you're, you're, you're teaching your hands. Woodworking tools allow the carpenter to perform a larger number of actions on wood than by hand and arm alone, and in ways that are more efficient and precise. These actions include pounding, tapping, pulling, cutting, chopping, carving, bending, 
shaping, boring, scraping, smoothing, bracing, holding, pinching, cramping, joining, and measuring. While gripping and using hand tools, they become effective extensions of the carpenter's arms, hands, and fingers. You know, when we were talking about tools being a kind of extension of your hand, it's, it's like that. You get used to doing this. It's, it's just... If you had a, a 90 degree finger and thumb, it would be great, but... This looks a fairly basic tool, and it is. It probably hasn't changed in hundreds of years, this. Do you want to all have a go at doing that? That's fairly easy for some of you, I know. I was really intimidated by tools, actually, and especially planes, because they're so complicated, and setting them up was really difficult and really frustrating, and it's all really minute, and I don't think I really did know, but obviously you hold that, you do that, and you push it, and you can tell by looking at it, like, what you're roughly supposed to do with it. It's worth sort of getting to know it and becoming at one with your tool. Nothing that you do here should be a fight between you and the tool. These tools are sharp and it's the fact that they're sharp that's doing the work. It's not, you know, how strong your right arm is or anything like that. It's not about how much effort you put in. The more you try and make effort on this, the more those teeth will dig in and do nothing. And the other thing is you don't want this to be a tiring process. You're going to have to be doing a whole lot of this. So what you want to be doing is actually enjoying the process of getting from there to there. It's becoming a lot more instinctive and I know now what each tool feels like, even if I can't master it. I know what it feels like and I know what I'm going to try and do with it. And it's all becoming familiar. I stop focusing on the tool itself and start to transfer my focus onto the wood and what's happening um, rather than worrying about how I'm standing and worrying about how I'm holding the saw. I automatically pick up the saw, stand in a certain position and start sawing, you know, without thinking, have I got my thumb in the right position and am I going in at the right angle and all of the beginnings of setting up and getting going sort of now come naturally. Why have I got this sticking out like that? To keep the blade where I want it to be. So, so I've been doing this for probably over 30 years anyway. And I still do that. It's not the baby's way to do it. It's, it's a way that, that works. If it works for you, it works for you. If it doesn't, it doesn't. And this is to do with touch. Probably the most sensitive parts of your fingers and, and your thumb is going to be there or the nail itself. Yeah, so if you haven't got nails, it really doesn't matter. Use the pad of your thumb and just touch it against the saw because then you'll feel any slight movement either way. That way puts more pressure on, that way takes pressure off, and you'll feel that happen. It's not easy. You know, carpentry takes a lot of logic, takes a lot of puzzle solving. So you know these techniques and these tools and these things to try and solve this problem and it's all solving problems, you know, it's no easier than it is solving some super hard maths problem, you know, they're just given a different set of tools. Everything you're doing is informing you about the next bit and, you know what I mean, it's, the, I love the complexity of it. You're doing something with your hands, you're making something, you're kind of building. Like I'm using my mind more than I did. Like learning new ways of thinking about things, new skills, problem solving, I'm getting better at that. And working with other people as well and just kind of seeing what their skills are and trying to pick up on theirs. I think particularly if there's more finer kind of work, you know, cabinet design and stuff, you know, there's a huge amount of knowledge. You know, it's everything from the, the timber you're using, because the properties of that timber will obviously affect it, you know, down to the tools you can use to solve it. But it's not also just having the knowledge, it's picking the right solution for the problem, if that makes sense. You know, cause you, you could pick a solution that wasn't wrong, but it probably wouldn't, wasn't the best either. So I think, you know, you have to be really switched on to solve all these problems.
I think it's a type of intelligence. It just feels like part of the thought process, really. For me, it's the knowledge of knowing how things go together, knowing how things fit and things work, and being able to make things. I definitely do think society as a whole, I think it is seen as, yeah, you're book smart and you're knowledgeable and academic, or you make things with your hands. So I definitely appreciate what people do with their hands now. But they're skills for life, aren't they? Like anywhere you go, there's going to be stuff that needs fixing. And it's just kind of being able to have the confidence to think you could do that, you know. As a lot of people, I have a fear of not leaving a legacy. I like the idea of making something which can outlast me. I really like the idea of getting into a tradition. I'm not going to invent anything here, and I don't want to. Far smarter people than me, over thousands of years, have worked out the best way to make a mortise and tendon joint. I'm not going to improve on that. If I can learn that and continue on with it and possibly pass it on at some stage, I think that's fantastic. Five years from now, I'd like to have my own company, um, probably doing cabinet making and possibly green oak framing on the side. I really want to learn this skill to a high standard. And then whatever I do from then on, I'd like to know that I have that skill to hand. And whether it's build a house or make furniture. I want to be a maker and I want to have a specific skill. And I don't know quite where that's going to take me yet. I hope that there's always something to learn with carpentry. I mean, people used to do, like, seven-year apprenticeships and they're not even, they weren't even a master after seven years, so I really think that you don't stop learning. Ideally, I would like to work in a small workshop, kind of, like, for my own business, making furniture. It's a bit furniture, but I also would like to do house renovations and restorations I'm interested in like restoring old houses. Yeah, I'd say throughout the second year, especially when we'd started to work together, that it you know it became a reality that this was gonna be you know, possibility. That was when I sort of realised that I was going to make a career out of it. Yeah, I think that was in the second year and we decided that ideally we just wanted to carry on the practice that we were learning in the studio. Which combined design and making. Yeah, there was definitely a determination to find a workshop and get working as quickly as possible. I don't think either of us ever questioned that we would continue doing this no. as a profession. I feel now like a maker, like I can make furniture but also other things you've got the knowledge or the sort of confidence to make anything I don't think there'll ever be a time when people don't want to make things by hand human beings have a desire to make things by hand I think that'll always be the case most of the things that we end up designing actually don't lend themselves to hand tools at all so I think that's partly why we really love getting commissions where we can use hand tools when you've made something with hand tools, it feels more like you've made it rather than the machine's made it. You've got to do everything with a hand tool. You've got to set it up, you've got to sharpen it, you've got to know how to use it mm. and know what it feels like. The beauty, I guess, of learning with hand tools is that you can do it anywhere and it's, it's just... And it's quiet. Mm, it's quiet. When you see people picking up tools for the first time, actually, the memory of that is very clear because it wasn't that long ago that we were doing the same thing. And, and actually, it's then that I started to realise how much confidence I have in my own skill. You can see people doing things with difficulty that actually aren't difficult for you anymore. You can see how far you've come when you look back to how when we, when we first started. Work is now such a big part of my life where it wasn't before. Um, and the way people react to what you do is really interesting. It's definitely becomes a big part of your identity. And people do ask like how you make things and what skills you have and mm. what tools you use. And you talk about it a lot, I think. Mm. You're a person that can make things and knows how things go together. And that's definitely been my experience of becoming, you know, changing careers so dramatically.
Um, but I like that people think that I can do anything. <laughs> it's really nice. I don't want to do anything else and I don't think I would enjoy anything else as much and it's challenging but it's it's still a bit like you have to pinch yourself when you come into your workshop every day and think oh this is my job I get to do this what I want to do every day. In 1937 carpenter and historian Walter Rose thoughtfully concluded that it isn't possible to picture a carpenter or joiner apart from his tools. To such experienced bench hands, the tools are cooperators in the common service of life, the character of the tool becoming like that of the owner.